Hello there, you're welcome to Biology Lectures with Akiridi. Hola, Dimiji Philip. It's my pleasure to have you back with me. So today we move on to question 2014 of the UTME Past Question Series. Get your writing materials and let's get to work. The lowest level of organization in living organism is, that would be cell. So let's say cell is number one, that's the lowest, followed by tissue, followed by organ and mid forming system. So we can say it here that, of course, we have cells, excuse me, that forms tissue and tissues form organs and collection of organs forms system, all right? And different system forms the organism like we are. Humans are a collection of systems to form the entire organism. Now, you can see also in plant now that that means, in case you don't know before that, a leaf is an organ that's made up of different tissues. A flower is an organ made up of different tissues. A fruit is an organ. And other also makes up a system in plants and having different organs or the entire organism. For short, some books will call it system some will call it organ system it means the same thing so the answer here is um, um cell now you can actually go a bit further than that there's something smaller than cell those will be called organelles like the structures in cells so you can say so you have organelles like this likes of cell what's it called them um, mitochondria uh, ribosomes and all of those structures um, nucleus, all of them come together to form a cell. So in case the question says what is lower than a cell, you can actually remember the fact that we have organelles in the cells. All right. Which of the following is the most complex according to cellular level of organization? The most complex. Okay, now the, the hair, well, that's not like a living thing so to say we don't really euglena is just a single cell so it's a cell then hydra is made up of endoderm and ectoderm that is actually a tissue so hydra is a tissue so let's say this is a cell this is a tissue then the heart is made up of different type of tissues yes the ventricles the auricles are different type of tissue in it so that is a that's an organ. So the answer is heart. Heart is the most complex in this regard because it's at the organ level. Other ones, the, the one next to is hydra, which is not even, which is not up to an organ. So that's why we have this again. I actually repeated this for you to know. So the heart is is here. Okay, sorry, the heart is here. Well, the the hydra is here. The hydra is here. It's just at the level of a tissue, so to say. Which of the following organism is multicellular? Which means it has more than one cell. Chlamydomonas is just one single cell, it's an algae. Um, Spirogyra is a filamentous algae that has other cells. Amoeba is one singular cell. Euglena is also a singular cell. So the answer to this is going to be Spirogyria. This is sp um, the filament of Spirogyria, so to say. So you can see. So this. Once this is a single filament that is made up of different cells, so to say, each of those cells has uh, their um, nucleus in it. All right, this one just trying to talk about um, conjugation spirogyria. I talked about probably in 1978 video. All right, in bryophyte, sex organs are produced in the. Uh, Gametophyte, yes. The name says gametes, gametophyte it means gamete producing plants. So let me show you what that looks like. This is actually bryophyte, but this one is um, the moss because bryophytes we have the mosses and we have the liverworts. Liverworts, so to say. So these ones are majorly aquatic. These mosses are found on the rock or harder substance or other surfaces like that. So here, this is this is the life cycle of a bryophyte. So you see it here that this part here, this is we call this a deeper generation that has sporophytes. So this part here is called sporophyte. That the one that produces the spore are called sporophytes. So when it's sporophytes, the sporophyte of course produces spore that that is released 
and that's that spore must have been produced by meiosis that means it has been reduced from diploid 2n initially these spores were initially 2n so you know second 2n please which means diploid then by meiosis it's going to become n so when this n germinates this spore germinates germinates into gametophyte and um um Yes, gametophyte, which are now male and female. So, from the male gametophyte, the sperm cell will swim to the female gametophyte that contains a structure called archegonium. So, it means that male gametophyte contains antheridium. Within antheridium, you have sperm cell, and within the female gametophyte, you have what called archegonium, which contains the egg cell. So, the, the, the sperm will then swim to that. Now, here, this this particular guy needs water. For them to bring about reproduction if they don't have water it won't happen that means that that's one of the reasons why they are called one of the, the the lowest level of um lowest they are the lowest level of development of plants they rely on water for them to carry out reproduction because it is when rain has fallen or water is available that's when the sperm cell can swim from the gametophyte the gametophyte are actually independent of each other so they have to the sperm cell will have to swim from the male gametophyte to female gametophytes all right, hope this is good. And what you're seeing here is called alternation of generation, which means in case whereby this is diploid generation and this is haploid generation. You're alternating between two types of generation, the diploid and the haploid. All right, or you see sporophyte generation or the gametophyte generation. Sporophyte generation produces spore, gametophyte generation produces gametes, so to say. Seed plants are the most dominant vegetation on land because now why they are motile gametes that's the major th reason do you know why because they have gametes that is not dependent on water because now it says here seed plants so the point is it says here i believe for the that that's not the reason efficient seed dispersal oh let me take this again seed plants are the most dominant vegetation on land because um they have efficient this seed dispersal yes the acid can be disp can be spread by animals by water even sometimes by wind so that helps to spread them around so the, that helps them so efficient seed dispersal unlike other other animals or other plants that doesn't have enough way to spread their wing to, to spread their seeds around all right which of the following is an arboreal organism arboreal means organism that lives on trees or yeah on trees basically so from what we have here which of these ones do you think lives on trees we will say the bird now be careful here i we often hear people do, we have two type of habitat we have terrestrial and aquatic some people will say we have terrestrial aquatic and arboreal well the point is if trees are found on the land which is terrestrial then i think arboreal is, should, should be part of terrestrial because the trees are not floating and there's no organism that stays in the air all its life it has to stay somewhere so arboreal is a subset of terrestrial habitat so these are other ex examples of organisms, monkeys, um, squirrels, um, birds, even snakes, not all snakes anyway, but some snakes live on, on the trees, so they are called arboreal. All right. Now, what you're seeing here is saying this is a delta formula of an organism. So, I means incisor. It means it has two incisor up, it has one incisor down. C means canine. It doesn't have any canine at all, both up and down. PM is premolar, M is molar. Now, what you should know here is this. You can tell the kind of food an organism feeds on by the way, by the way of its dental formula. So basically here, for the fact that this organism does not have any canine, it is not, it, it doesn't eat anything that has to do with flesh. So it is, it is a herbivore. But omnivore and carnivore we definitely have canine because they feed on flesh. All right. So basically here, I want you to pause the video here and study this. You're going to see that all the ones I'm going to be cycling, rabbits, they don't have canine. Goat and cow, which I also have before, their canine is just one beneath. Rat and mouse, 
no canine elephants no canine kangaroo just have has one canine sheep just has one canine so you can see there's a consistency in all of those ones that are grass eater herbivores while the ones that are carnivore like the dogs have canine uh, man, which are uh, omnivore, I eat flesh and plants, are also, um, they also have canine. So you can see that there basically, this is self explanatory. You do, if you, it means you pause the video, please do to study this dental formula, it's going to help you. For example, let me go back there, I have to show you something. If you look at this and compare it to what we have here, what organism do you think has this from what you have? here has two up and has nothing down as that's going to be your rabbit if you look closely that's the rabbit that's the rabbit all right a circulatory system is very essential in mammals but not in smaller organisms like amoeba because amoeba lives in fresh water no because the efficient is sufficient to transport materialized amoeba yes now let me show you there's something called um, um, surface area to volume ratio this is like amoeba in its environment the surface area is in contact with all the all the parts of this organism let's assume that's amoeba i just used the box yes it's all in contact it's all in contact with its environment so it can actually it's just one single cell so the surface area to volume ratio is very very low so, I mean, it's very, very high, I mean to say. So, for that reason, it is going to, division is enough for it. But for a cell like this, the point, the question is, you will know that the water, the fluid comes, comes like that. How about the, this other inside part, all these inside parts that are hidden? You can't, division cannot get to those parts. How much more this bigger one here? That's why for this kind of organism, you need blood vessels, circulatory system, that will take nutrients to each of the cells. Because if you just put the cells around here, in, in, you just put the cell around the fluid, only the ones outside here will get nutrients. If I thought they get all the nutrients, the ones in between, within, will not get uh, the nutrient. That's so the reason is because division is, so the answer is B. The reason is because division is enough for amoeba because it has high. Um, surface area to volume ratio. All right, moving on. In vascular plants, the sieve tubes and companion cells represent are present in the sieve tube in the phlegm. Phlegm is the structure that transports manufactured food, and this is what it looks like. So this is a phlegm. So this here to here is called sieve tube and it has what we call companion cell sieve tube is actually like a dead space it used to have its own nucleus but it doesn't have any nucleus anymore so it relies on the nucleus of companion cell to stay alive so it created the space for something to be able to move through so that's why there's no nucleus in it anymore but however it stays alive by the by companion cells and you can see each sieve tube is separated by what we call sieve plates sieve plates all right if you have seen my lecture on transport in plants, this will be much easier. You can check that up later. But this is okay for your um, for that question there. The stomata of leaves are similar in function to the question we need to ask ourselves is what's the function of stomata in the first place? Stomata is the holes, tiny holes on the surface of leaves for what? Gaseous exchange. That's what air, oxygen goes out of and goes into carbon dioxide comes into during photosynthesis as the case may be and the same stomata is the structure within which uh, water vapor which is actually transpiration that's transpiration means the removal of um, water in form of vapor out of the leaf goes through so from what i've just said what do you think it represents is represents fangs of human skills of of fishes spiracles of insect trachea of toads it sounds like 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 the the, the the trick the stomata is like like as if you're talking about the noses like the nose of plants and that answer is going to be that is similar to in this option will be spiracles if you have an insect like this i didn't get to help that's like let's say this the insect you see the segment of this thing like that's like let me see that's um 
a grasshopper. You will see some tiny holes like that along the length. Those tiny holes are called spiracles. That hole is the hole through which CO2 goes out of that organism. And that's the same hole through which oxygen goes in. So that's like their own nostrils, so to say. So it's similar to spiracles in insects. All right. The use of moist skin for respiration or gaseous exchange, which I would prefer, is um, in amph amphibians is known as cutaneous respiration. This is what we what this is what it means. This is what we need. Yes, the body of um, amphibians, namely frog here, have. Well, it's well vascularized, has a lot of blood vessels, so oxygen literally can can dissolve on the surface and can, can be gaseous exchange. As a matter of fact, this guy has three ways it respires or can gaseous exchange. He does it by using lungs, he does it by using buccal cavity. The membrane of the mouth can also carry some gaseous exchange. I also does it by using the skin. He does this majorly in water or in a moist environment, so to say. All right. Water in plants is removed as water vapor through the process of, I think I mentioned that not quite long, transpiration. Not evaporation, no. It's transpiration. Removal of water vapor through plants is called transpiration. Now, there's something I want you to remember. It happens through what? Through the stomata, like I told you, that you can see water, water coming out of the stomata. Now, this is where well, it ought to be stoma. So don't mind me, I like to be conscious of spellings. Stomata means plural, stoma means singular. So this is just one, it ought to be stoma. But I guess you may get the point. So water vapor coming out of this is called, is called transpiration. However, don't mistake transpiration for another process we call gotation. G-U-T-T-A-T-I-O-N, gotation, which means collection of water, literally. It looks like this. Now, this is gotation. This is not transpiration, please. Gotation is, is like you, water just, I mean, transpiration, water just goes into atmosphere like that. You can see what is happening here, like that. It goes into atmosphere. But gotation, the water is collected on the surface of the leaves. If you want to achieve, you want to collect water from, a, like from plants during transpiration, you have to probably have to tie a leather bag around the mouth of the leaf after some time you're going to see some water vapor in that water in that leather bag but for gotation you don't have to do that the water is coming out through the edges of the leaf by through a structure called hyda toads hyda hyda toads all right so this is i so hyda toad is a structure through which gotation takes place while stomata is the uh, the structure th through which transmission takes place so they are not the same please all right an example of an organ of perination in plant is perination means um ability of a of, of a plant well i think other organisms also exhibit anyways of a plant to be able to stay alive to be able to pro uh, retain its um, reproductive structure till the next season. All right, so example of that will be rhizome here. So rhizome, so this, most of these are organisms that use some sort of vegetative reproduction, yes. So the, the rhizome can actually stay in the soil, even the bulb of onion can stay there for some time till the next um, planting season. That's me of what perination means, all right. Alternation of generation is a feature known in what? I told you, I showed you a diagram not quite long. Deployed generation, which is porophyte generation, haploid generation, which is what gametophyte generation. So from what we know, the answer is going to be mosses. All right, mosses, mosses, mosses. Coordination and regulation of body activities in animals are achieved by nerves and muscles, nerves and hormones. Well, let me put it this way to you. The two systems that controls our, that controls our body is majorly the 
nervous system and endocrine system now from what we have in the option here nerves is from is from nervous system hormone is from endocrine system so we work with option b which says nerves and hormones hope you understand why we chose this now because really what we are is usually under the two functions or the function of those two systems i mentioned endocrine system and nervous system the part of the brain responsible for peristalsis is okay what's peristalsis peristalsis is um a process whereby um food moves through the alimentary canal like it's 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 like a wave-like contraction of food so as move mo as food moves through the osophagus so it's like a contraction segment realization segment so as it contract like that it pushes food like, like that all through as it moves through the gut all right through the alimentary canal or gastrointestinal tract now that process is involuntary we don't know it you can't you can't you, you can't tell me now that you know food is moving through your your gut you don't know that so from this here that's a clue which of this one do you think controls if you see my other videos that controls involuntary action the answer is going to be medulla oblongata it controls involuntary action like heartbeat swallowing um breathing rate peristalsis most of those internal involuntary actions are controlled by that in fact it, it also affects blood pressure also all right so this is the medulla oblongata around here that controls those functions i mentioned which includes peristalsis which is an involuntary action which of the following instrument is used for measuring atmospheric pressure okay. that would be the barometer hydrometer is that's water kind of specific gravity hygrometer which is option b is used to measure relative humidity which talks about amount of dryness sorry amount of moist in the atmosphere yes white thermometer is just temperature as it were so this is what a barometer looks like this is like the old one i don't know if it's still in use and this is the new ones we have now like actually used to know the pressure of the environment don't forget that barometer is for pressure thermometer is for temperature hygrometer is for relative humidity the influence of soil on organism in a habitat is referred to as edaphic yes edaphic factor is what affects uh, when you just refer to soil it's edaphic factor basically all right now please um lithosphere talks about the hard part which includes soil rock any other thing but when you just talk about soil alone that's edaphic factor the genetic makeup of an organism is described as what? All the genes in an organism is put together as called as one word, the genotype. The genotype, like the genes that makes up someone is the genotype. All right. The major limiting factor of productivity in aquatic habitat is okay, that would be the sunlight. Why? Because sunlight is needed for producers all right so when sunlight is not available all through the ocean you only have sunlight available for some centimeters so only that's that's that few meter that that's what you have photosynthesis but all these that are found deep down this is a, a, an ocean this is a picture of the ocean you can see how dark it is as you are moving downward these areas are actually more 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 dark so you can't expect a plant to really photosynthesize in, in those places if i thought it will it will be that sufficient so sunlight affects that habitat which of the following group of organisms feed feeds directly on green plants of course i told you that the first organism to feed on the producer which are green plants are always the primary consumers so option A. So this is all the rat, the rabbit, which are always herbivores, are the primary consumers. All right. You can pause the video to 
look at this more and you know that secondary consumers are majorly carnivores most of the time a characteristic feature of a tropical rainforest is that it contains trees with narrow leaves no they need to have broad leaves because the place is always so moist they need to get rid of water from their system contain large number of plant species that made sense contains fewer number of plant species no have total annual rainfall of about of less than 50 centimeter cube centimeter no it can be less than that it could be around that it's not less than it can actually be around that or more than that so this is what we're talking about this is tropical rainforest you have all sort of plants of different height these are the ones when you talk about ocean um forest these are these ones are called emergent ones these ones are the ones that will form the canopy one so to say all right you know you have different strata in the ocean that's the ocean sorry in the in the tropical rainforest you have different strata you have ground dwellers and all of that like five layers or so all right so yeah this is what we're saying again you have all sort of plant species there so this is correct it contains large number of plant species evidently that is true from what we are seeing on the screen the study of how and why Population size change over time is called mm, I think that should be population ecology. Yes, I think that should be population ecology. I'm um, not I think I should be I would say I'm about 80% sure of that that should be population ecology. A severe and long dry season in is a characteristic feature of of course, that's going to be Sahel savanna. Yes. If I want to arrange this from the wettest to the driest, the answer, of course, is A. If I want from the, the, the wettest is going to be one mangrove swamp followed by Guinea savanna. We don't have tropical rainforest. That should have come before Guinea savanna. Then we're going to have um, three, which is Sudan savanna. Then the last one is going to be what? Sahel savanna. That's like it's becoming drier. All right. Which of the following is a nitrogen fixing blue green algae of soil? Interesting. So it is nitrogen fixing, it's also blue green. The answer to that is anabina. It can photosynthesize, seriously. I can also fix um, nitrogen. So it also feeds using chemicals. So that's we call it cyanobacteria also. So, but Clostridium, Nitrosomonas, and Rhizobium are basically. Um, chemosynthetic bacteria, so to say, they, 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 they play a role. This one fixes nitrogen. This one, these two, sorry, nitro, Clostridium also fixes nitrogen. Nitrosomonas is one of the nit, uh, nitrogen, uh, nit, nitrifying bacteria. Nitrosomonas is one of the nitrifying bacteria that converts uh, nit, ammonia to um, is it ammonium to nitrites? While nitrites is combined to nitro by nitrobacter, basically, but nitrosomonas is just nitrifying bacteria, so to say, because it plays a role in converting ammonium to nitrates. But anabena is also a nitrogen fixing bacteria. But the reason why we choose, why we didn't choose rhizobium, because it says here blue green algae. So it's also photosynthesize. That's one funny thing about it. I don't know if I have the diagram here. Yes, this is what anabina looks like. All right. The soil with highest water retaining capacity, which means can hold on to water without allowing water to pass through it, will be. I want you to look at this diagram and think of what the answer will be. Pause the video to look at it for a while. Okay, I guess you mentioned clay. Yes. Imagine you have 10 mil of water here. 10 mil of water here, 10 mil of water poured into three of them equally. And see what you have here. You see what you have here. See what you have here. For clay soil, it's like maybe it's only two mil that escaped. That means the remaining eight mil is here. This one is like you have five mil here. Five mil is retained back here. This one is like you have like eight mil here. Maybe only two mil is retained here. So it means that uh, clay soil has the highest retaining water 
capacity or water retaining capacity basically it can hold on to water so that's because it has lesser space in between its molecule while water has a lot of sorry sandy soil has a lot of space spaces within its molecule that's why water can just pass through easily the causative agent of polyomyelitis is a virus all right so the agent that causes polyomyelitis is actually a virus it's a viral disease all right one of the ways of controlling noise pollution in urban areas is by site industry away from residential area. That made sense that fuel should be completely combusted by engines. Now we're talking about noise, so that's, 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 air, that's air pollution, bees air pollution. By planting trees on both sides of the road, that's try to control air pollution by wearing ear devices. Well, that's a way to prevent it or to control it but a bit yeah but it makes more sense the one of the ways not to even make it to to start noise pollution in the first place is all industries should be sited far away from where people are that will help to reduce so the noise should be made outside where people are living all right a constituent of the exhaust fumes from electricity generating sets which causes serious pollution is Carbon monoxide, CO, or carbon or carbon two oxide means the same thing. Carbon two oxide is the same thing as carbon monoxide. Yes, that is very very dangerous. It's a silent killer. That's why we always told when you are, when you put on your generator set, let the exhaust face outside. All right, it's very very important. I I, I have. I don't want to bore you with stories. I, I can talk about people I've heard that died in their sleep because the the scarab monoxide has accumulated in the room where they slept and that ended up claiming their life. So carbon monoxide is very dangerous. All right. Which of the following is true of smallpox? <laughs> it is transmitted by bacteria. No. It is transmitted by viruses. I want you to remember that, please. And for that reason, it can be effectively controlled by antibiotics. That is no. You don't use antibiotics for viral disease. You only use antibiotics for, for bacterial disease. So option B is also wrong. It can be effectively controlled by vaccination. Yes, because it is, um, you, you can give vaccine for that. That's correct. It is waterborne. No, it's actually airborne. So the answer is B and C, this is also wrong. Don't forget that option B, B I mentioned that antibiotics is only used for bacterial disease. Viral disease, what you can do is either get vaccine before the disease comes, or when it happens, you just allow your immune system to respond to it. All right. So this is what smallpox looks like. Smallpox and chickenpox has some things in common. They both have rash. But the point is, for smallpox, the rash is going to be more on the face and the limbs, the extremities of the limbs and on the body, like not so much on the body. But for that of chickenpox, it's more on the face and the trunk. The trunk includes the thorax, which is the chest and abdomen, which is the belly of that area, so to say. But smallpox is like almost all over the whole body, but it's going to be more on the face, extremities of the body and some part of the trunk as it were. A pollutant that is mostly associated with acid rain. That would be uh, okay, nitrogen four oxide. Yes, I know that nitrogen nit nitrogen oxide basically can be part of that. So we can work with this. Even sulfur oxide also can be part of a constituent that can that leads to formation of acid acid rain as it were. When the adults have reached a certain degree of weakness, the process of binary fusion is replaced by conjugation. Okay, yeah. Um, paramecium is one among these four, is the only one that it uses uh, conjugation, which means when two cells come together and the two nuclei fuses. It does that because it does that when they are weak. Normally what they use, you actually use binary fusion. It's just one uh, paramecium split into two paramecia like that. But in this case here, yeah, when they're actually weak and the environment is not conducive, they will actually 
do some sort of symbiosis they will come together and unite their their um, nuclei to form a new one all right worlds arches and loops and compound are types of variation in fingerprints yes fingerprint i think you can look if the yours is here i think mine is loop i think i've seen this over time mine is loop you should know yours too well it's not so important but it's something you should know so the examples of fingerprints all right a couple has 10 children all female which of the following best explain explains the situation the sex determination was by the man's x chromosome yes but let me see other options the man's sperm count is low it doesn't have to be sperm count the woman is not capable of producing male child it's not the woman's fault the sex determination was by the man's y chromosome if it was y chromosome it was donating it's meant to have a male so the answer is a it's man's x chromosome that determines it now let me say when i say it's not the woman's fault it doesn't mean, mean it's the man's fault too the only thing is that it is the man that produces sperm that will carry x chromosome while some other will carry y chromosomes so but it doesn't mean the man deliberately knows which of the sperm cell that is carrying x cell or that's carrying x chromosome or y chromosome he doesn't know it's nobody's fault but the point is it is from the body of the man that the determination of sex of a child is it's made really that's the sort of the matter a biological agent which sorry with antiviral property is oh interferons the answer is interferons let me tell you what interferon means this is a cell this is another cell this is another cell if for one reason this cell is attacked by a virus at the instance where this guy is attacked by a virus, this um, cell will send signal to the neighboring cells, telling them that I have been affected by I'm being affected at the moment by a virus. In response to that, these two other cells will start secreting a fluid called interferon. What will interferon do? Is going to prevent the virus from getting from entering or invading them when the cell when they come to them. So it's like informing someone ahead of time that, well, I'm being attacked at the moment. You guys should get ready. So interferon has a way of so these other cells will secret interferon that will prevent to some extent prevent the virus from gaining entrance into both of them. All right. So it is the cells that has been alerted that will secrete it all right and then it will prevent so it has some sort of antiviral property so to say one of the advantages of outbreeding is um, outbreeding is like you 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 getting you you you're getting other other um so what's it called like, like you're taking the it's like you're seeing cross pollination, so to say, you're taking the pollen green of this organism of this flower to another one. So pest tolerance, disease resistance, fast growth, tall height. I think it's gonna be um disease resistance in a way it can actually make a an organism more um, resistant to disease because it's like you're 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 forming to a, a better genetic makeup when you actually outbreed, so to say, you are mixing two genetic materials of a bit. Like other, this one probably has one advantage, which, which, which this one doesn't have. So when you merge it together, it has a way of helping reduce um, diseases on the plant or animal. Or let's say it, it, um, it says it's a, it increases disease resistance as it were. An individual with blood group AB can receive blood from those in blood group, blood group or blood group or blood groups. Well, the, the truth is, AB can give to everyone. Sorry, can receive, please. Can receive from... Say, an individual with blood group AB can receive blood from everyone. But AB can only give 
to itself. That's one funny thing. It can only it can give to everyone, but can only receive. So it, sorry, it can receive from everybody because it doesn't have antibody at all, but can only give to itself. So if if it wants to donate, it can only donate to A B. So the answer is gonna be A is gonna be option A. Yes, it can receive blood from those in blood group A, B, A, B, and O. So that's why we call it universal recipient. That's blood group A, B. So this is what we're saying here. So this is blood group A, B, receiving from everybody. So there's no agglutination, there's no clumping. So you can receive from O, from receiving from O, receive from A, it's from A, B, it's from B and A, B. That's because it doesn't have any antibody. All right. The streamlined shape of fishes is an adaptation of, for what? Well, it's for movement, actually, for movement within the, that's what they can swim. Is that a fish can, it can either be flat like this, swimming this way, or like this. Either way, they have a streamlined body that helps them to move through the water. An example of paukilotamic animal, which means cold-blooded, is the lizard. Yes, rabbit and birds are both um, warm-blooded or homeotamic animals. Cockroaches, well, I think they're just there. All right, they're not being categorized as warm-blooded or anything, really. So the answer here is lizard. All living organisms are constantly involved in a struggle for existence. This was proposed by who? That should be by, yes, Jean, La sorry, not Jean Lamarck, uh, Robert Charles Darwin, please. It is Darwin, yes, option B, Charles Darwin. Morgan actually just played, a, a, Morgan's contribution was in genetics. He was the one that said that we have genes in chromosomes, really. Lamarck, Gene Lamarck, you know that one talked about use and disuse. And Wallace, or is it Wallace? I don't, I'm not sure I got that pronunciation very well. Wallace also, um, I think it's Alfred Wallace, worked together with um, Charles Darwin in bringing about natural selection. But Charles Darwin is actually more popular at it, and I think he's the one that actually worked the most, so, but uh, Alfred Wallace also played a role in discovery of natural selection too. Adaptive radiation is <laughs> illustrated in, okay, okay. Now, this is what adaptive radiation means. This is a beak of insects, sorry, of bird which used to eat seed, then over a period of time, other type of beak were developed based on the type of habitat they found themselves, all right? So that's what happened. That's, this was actually done by, um, was this by, by um, Darwin when he went to Galapagos Highland and he saw that one particular uh, bird, the beak had changed as radiated into or changed into other type of birds and that happened because of the demand of where they are found so i think i want to work with modified insect mouth part which is different we have biting and chewing insect we have sucking insect we have piercing insect which i think means different mouth part for different kind of substances so to say all right this question looks a bit somehow but i think i will work with that if i want to analyze it all the way you might end up getting more confused but let me just leave it there all right growth is mainly apical growth is specific with definite shape growth is throughout life which are the following above correctly describes growth pattern in plants in plants in plants okay in plants they majorly grow Upward, that's the mean of apical. That's correct. Growth is throughout life. I think I will work with one and three. They keep growing. It's only animals that stops growing. They keep growing. I think I work with one and three, which is option B. Sorry, option D. One and three is option D, please. Growth is mainly apical. They go that way. 
and it's all through life for them. Okay, uh, use the diagram to answer qu this question. The part label two is um, okay. I think let's f do some labeling. One should be um, one should be eye spot, even though it's not really pointing there directly. Uh, two should be contractile vehicle. Three should be chloroplast. Chloroplast. Um, four, I'm not quite sure if it's cytoplasm, if it's nucleus. I'm not so sure what four is really. So it says here, so two will be the eye spot. Eye spot. That's what two. Sorry, that's one is eye spot. Two should be contractor vacuum, please. D. Contractor vacuum, yes. Two should be contractor vacuum. Then it says use the diagram above to answer. Okay, the part resemble for photosynthesis is labeled. If you can remember, we said three was chloroplast. So the answer is going to be A, which is three. All right. Use the diagram to answer the question. The young proglotid is represented by what? Well, let's 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 do a little labeling. One is rostellum. Two is hook for attachment. Three should be soccer. K E R. Four should be the young or let's say proglotids. Proglo T I D E. Proglotids like double T. So this is neck. But don't forget this old thing is called scolex. Scolex. Call C O L E X. Please don't mind my handwriting, please. So the young proglotids will be four, which is um, B. Now, as this um, tapeworm grows, really it's going to look like this. So it's going to be like as a, moving away from the head or the neck, the proglotids are becoming more mature. So the most mature proglotids will be here. This will be the most mature proglotids that will contain the ovary and the testes which can actually fertilize each other there so this segment we just cut off this last segment can actually cut off and go with the feces of the host to go into the the uh, intermediate host outside there which can either be pig or um cattle or let me say cow as it were in the diagram the organ for attachment to the lining of the host Intestine are labeled, of course, hook is for attachment, soccer is for attachment, that's two and three. So that's option A. Two and three are for attachment. In the diagram, the part labeled one. Okay, let's do this together. One is actually, you can try to attempt this first. Root hair. Two is cortex. Three should be the xylem four should be the phlegm all right you have to be very very careful with diagrams that's why you may have learned diagrams very well so that you'll be able to know what it looks like where even when it's not properly drawn like we've seen examinations like this so it says here the part labeled one is what that would be the root hair so i don't know if you have a diagram for this here no okay i think i have for the next one the diagram is the transverse section of it is of course for, for having root hair it is root so the answer is it's of dicot dicotyledonous root why because it doesn't have teeth let me show you what i'm trying to say for this is a dicot that has this is xylem like that this is xylem then this is phlegm these structures this is phlegm. You can see this is phlegm. This is phlegm. But let me show you what a monocot root looks like. So, this hole here is called pith. So it has pith. The the, the root of of um, of um. Oh, sorry. 
It's still the same thing, please. I didn't get that off. Wow. Mm, what do I do? Let me take this again. The transverse section of a, okay, this diagram is, okay, what does it represent? It represents a dicotyledonous root. Why? Let me show you something. Sorry. Yes, this is a dicot root that has what we call xylem like that it looks like it's start the middle while for uh it has a what's it called there flame like that but for a monocot root i think i have to draw that here for a monocot root it's going to look somewhat like this it's going to have everything hair root hair like that so yeah, i'm trying to rush that i actually want to what i'm concerned about with is with what is within it so it's going to have Pericycle and all of those things. It's going to look like this, like that. Xylem, phlegm, like that. Sorry, like that. So this bigger cycle structure is xylem, while this small one is called phlegm. And this space is called peace. So pith is only present in the... So instead of having xylem at the middle there, that's what monocot stem will look like. So a monocot stem looks like this. A monocot root, I mean to say, looks like this. It has pith at the middle. But for dicot, you are having... Instead of having pith at the middle, what we have in the middle is actually xylem. Please don't forget this. It's very important.